Good morning. Good resurrection morning. Hey, I, I hope we're all being safe out there. Uh, this is definitely an unusual time, and but you know what? God is on the throne, and we're putting our trust in him. Let us, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time to worship, Lord, on this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, you are so awesome. Lord, the promise that you gave us and, uh, and the Holy Spirit that you've given us, Lord. We just thank you so much, Lord, that you dwell within us and that you guide us and that you direct us and that you comfort us, Lord. And today as we celebrate uh, we celebrate the risen Lord, Lord, just pray that, uh, just pray, Lord, that you would be with us and, and uh, help us to have a heart of worship regardless of what's going on. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. So in John 20, uh, John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene uh, was going that morning uh, to tend to the body of Jesus. And when she arrived there, um, as we know, the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. And we serve a risen Savior. Amen. God promised us a Messiah and God gave us a Messiah. And Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, just as was foretold. And we can put our trust in him. Amen. He became sin, who knew no sin. Might be called his righteousness, he humbled himself, carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing, yeah, Jesus Messiah. Above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Messiah, the Lord of all, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love, hold us tremble. As the veil was torn, love so amazing, love so amazing, yeah, Jesus Messiah, name above all Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, who rescued the sinner, who ransomed from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah 
bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. You are, you are, you are my rescue story. You are, you are. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living God. Who could imagine? Great of mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. Resurrection Sunday, church. What an amazing time that is to be able to, to be here, to be here together with you uh, as under, under the circumstance here 
uh, we're still together in a sense. We're still the body. We still will always be the body of Christ. And it's awesome to be able to be able to speak to you in this way. And you know, if I do, my allergies are gun, going crazy today. So through all this wind and stuff. So if I cough, please don't turn off your television or spray your television with uh, disinfectant. It's going to be okay. So just a, a disclaimer is before we get going this morning. But it's a beautiful morning. I feel like Mr. Rogers this morning on this this broadcast network. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. But although I live in the hood, so I know what it's like. So it's true for me to know what this neighborhood looks like. But I do have a very important message for you this morning, all kidding aside. One of faith. We often question to what faith is. and what, what does faith look like? And what is faith? And what exactly is this? And this word from the original language is called pistis. And it's a belief with a predominant idea or trust or confidence, whether in God or in Christ, springing from faith in the same. So faith is about trusting. Trusting something. It's, it's you put your faith and trust in many things throughout the day. If you, if you think about it, how much things you put your faith and trust in. As you turn on this television this morning or your device that you're watching this morning, you had with confidence or just trust that it was going to turn on when you push the button. Throughout the day, we make these decisions because of trust. We trust that our vehicle is going to start. So there's these trusting things that we're looking at here. Another example of that, of this trust looking, is let's say Pastor James comes up to me and says, hey, I need your keys to your truck. And I automatically just give him the keys. And he takes off with them. And you're wondering, well, ain't you going to ask him what he's going to do with it? And my reply will be that, no, because I know and trust James enough to know that he's going to do the right thing. I know who he is. So that's my faith and trust that I know he's going to do the right thing. You know, sometimes I don't know, I don't need to know all the details. Sometimes I can get consumed with the details and I don't need to know all the details. I just need to trust. So that should should uh, prompt us to just think about what faith is a little bit. That brings us to chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark. And I want to start by praying for us this morning. So Father, I do thank you for this morning that you bless us. This great time that you have risen, Lord, it gets me excited. And I'm just so thankful, Lord, that you've given us new life. Thank you for rising once again, that we know on the last day we will rise as well. But Father, I just pray uh, for my family right now. I pray for the church. I pray for the church at large, all of the churches that are around, all the stuff that's going on, the sickness, all the stuff, Lord. I know that you're in control. But Father, I just ask that you would give us peace, that you would give us comfort, that we would put our faith and our trust in you, that know that you are a place of safety right now, and that we trust in you with all things. So thank you so much for this morning. Father, I just ask that I would step aside this morning and that your word would be presented precisely the way you intended it. So Father, we thank you so much for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin, I need you to trust me. So I'm going to start off with you trusting me this morning with what I must tell you. Yet it's no secret. It's the good news. It's the good news that I want to share with you. This good news. Who would want to withhold good news when you find out good news, right? See, you know, you get a job promotion. You get some good news in your life. You want to share it with others because it's meaningful to share it with others. It's, it's, it would be I'm sure it brings us happiness, but it's so much more when we're able to share this good news that has come to, to us. You know, it, it's, it's about this same thing. It's about this trust uh, as we look at it this morning. But it's funny how we ask a lot of times. We ask, hey, what's for dinner? Like it's going to matter. You know, we're, we're going to eat, right? So it's, a, it's funny that we, we're trusting that it's going to happen. So it's funny you say, well, what are we going to eat? Well, we're going to eat something. It doesn't matter. It's going to be edible for some of you that are um, do-it-yourself. So it, it will be edible. But with that said, as I told you, I need you to work with me this morning. As I paint you this picture of hope, hopefully you get to see what the Lord intends us to see through this passage this morning. As I said, we'll begin in this Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. 
And we're going to go through verses 1 through 8. And the reason we're only going through verses 1 through 8 this morning, because that's all there is. Well, you're, you might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. My, my Bible has more scriptures there. There's more than eight verses. Yes, there is. But in the original text, the original old manuscripts, only one through eight show up. So it tells us the rest of the verses were written at a later time. I'll let you research that. That's not part of my sermon this morning. But we're going to be going through verse 1 through 8 this morning. So as I said, I need you to work with me. Just Let's just say for a moment that the Gospel of Mark was one of the only uh, Gospels that there were, that was written. These part of the Synoptic Gospels, which is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which uh, that the word... Uh, this word synoptic gospels means harmony. They all work together to share with us everything that we need to know about Christ and who he was and how to live. So in, in, those, in those gospels, uh, they share in harmony. But I'm, what I'm asking you this morning, is, let's say that the gospel of Mark is the only thing that we have to go by. But it would seem through looking through Mark's gospel Mark's gospel seems like he's rushed in a bit at different times in his, in his writings. But it seems as we reach this chapter 16, it looks like he doesn't give much detail on what's happening here, on this resurrection. But may I remind you, he does. He gives us a lot, and we'll get to see that here in a moment. But I just want to share with you the, where the scene is. This scene unfolds as, as Jesus has been found guilty and standing in front of Pilate and is sent to the cross to be crucified. And you, you remember the day of what happened on that day and how he was on the road to Golgotha, Skull Hill, to be able to be crucified in this cross. And uh, as he got up there, he was nailed to the cross. And this is the moment and he ended up dying on that cross that evening. And his followers were crushed. And at the end of the day, when Jesus had died, Joseph of Arimathea went and asked Pilate, could I have the body? So he agreed and he gave him the body. And, he, and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and they got Jesus' body and they took it and anointed him with a bunch of aloes and myrrhs and stuff. And they put him in this tomb that belonged to Joseph. So this is where the scene is. And they got him and he put him in this, this tomb and there was a large stone put in front of it. So this is where we start off in our, on our chapter this morning. Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him, meaning Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen... They went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will ro roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they had laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Wow! It leaves us almost at the end of our chair of what happened here. But what I want you to see first is that this first day of the Sabbath, they said, had passed. This was the Sabbath time occurs between Friday evening into Saturday evening. So there was a time between Jesus' passing till Saturday evening. Now it's Sunday morning that these women are getting ready to go out to the tomb. We see Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome going to the tomb to anoint him. They did this many times to offset the smell 
of one's decomposing body. So they put these uh, different things on his body to anoint him to make him smell better. But this took, if you think about this, took much courage on their behalf of these three women that were going to the tomb. Because it says that it was, it was at daybreak, but yet, if you look into it, it was just barely light. So it was still darkness in the air. So as they were going to this tomb, it took much courage because someone that had just been murdered on a cross was laid in this tomb, and now they're going in the dark to see this tomb. Think about it for a minute. If it was for you and I, if we had to do the same thing, think if we, you and I, especially the women, would go, let's say you're going to the cemetery, and it's barely light enough to see, and you're walking to the cemetery looking for this tomb. Be kind of creepy, right? So it took courage on their behalf to be able to even go down this road. But what we also see here is these women were worried. Worried women. They were worried about the stone. Who would roll this stone, this big, large stone in front of it? They were coming thinking all of this stuff. How is this going to happen? And I'm sure that was on their mind as well is that these guards that were there guarding the tomb, how were they going to get past all of this? How were they ever going to pull all of this stuff off? As so many times, you and I worry about these same things. And we lose sleep over things that usually don't happen. But when these women arrived, to their amazement, the stone had already rolled back, was already rolled back. They had worried for nothing. God had already taken care of their worries and provided for their need. What a striking resemblance I see, church. We have to the simple story of many Christians today. How often is we as believers uh, are oppressed and saddened by the thought of hard times. And yet, when we get there, we feared for nothing because our stones had already been rolled away. The things that we thought that were going to be stopping us, God had already rolled the stone away in front of us. He had already taken care of our business. A large part of a person's anxieties arise from things which really never happen. We conjure up, if you're like me, you conjure up all these different things of what could happen, the what ifs and all this kinds of stuff. It, it clogs our imagination sometimes. We mentally carry tomorrow's troubles as well as today's. We're thinking about tomorrow and all the stuff that we have to do, and yet we haven't even finished the day. And very often it, we find at the end that our doubts and alarms were just stupid. And the things that we dreaded the most never came to pass. I want us to pray for more of a practical faith this morning. That we live in today, not in tomorrow, anything else. Live for today. God has called us to live in today. Don't worry about tomorrow. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 34, it says this. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And we should understand that. We haven't even got through today. Let's not worry about tomorrow. God's there already. So. I also want you to take note of this part. That these women are coming to a tomb to do what? What are they coming to this tomb for? Do you think they're expecting a resurrection? No. Because they came with these aloes and myrrhs to be able to anoint him. They, they wanted to anoint this dead body. Yet, Jesus had already told them that he would rise again. As with Jesus, he told them and the disciples, all these people who were listening, that he would rise again. And he tells you and me that he's coming back for us. Do you believe it? Even though he said it, do you believe he's coming back? It, seemed, it seems here that these women didn't believe what he had already told them. And I'm wondering the same. Are we understanding and, under, and ready for his coming? We don't know the time or the hour. We just, he just calls us 
and says that we need to be prepared for when he does come. Let's look at verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw this young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. This was this angel sitting there. So they finally get there. The stone was rolled away, and they went inside, and they seen this guy in this white robe. And they were freaked out. You know, I'm pretty sure that you guys have all experienced this, this thing. If you've gone into some, maybe a dark room, or you just into one room, all of a sudden you start to do something, you see somebody, and you're like, oh, I didn't even know you were there. That's kind of what their feeling probably was. That they like, wow, there's somebody in here. Verse 6 says that he said to them, this angel, he said, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. This angel told him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's going on. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here. Look, this is where they laid him. He's risen. He's not here. He's alive. He's been resurrected. The reason he told them not to be afraid, because they were. He could tell that they were afraid. When we're afraid, and when we get freaked out, a lot of times we allow fear to seize us and skew our thinking. When we're in a panic and we're in a rush, it usually often skews our thinking and our judgments. God has reminded us throughout His Word not to be afraid. We have nothing to fear. He's got us. He's still on the throne, and we have nothing to fear. You know, if we look at this resurrection, it's the source of eternal life for us who believe. Let me share this with you. Without the resurrection, the cross would mean nothing. Without the resurrection, the teaching of Jesus would mean nothing. The works of Jesus would mean nothing. Because without the resurrection, there would be no salvation, no hope for you and I. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 15, starting in verse 14, says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that but can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope is in Christ only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. So we can see what this resurrection means. But let's look at verse 20 because I don't want to finish because verse 20 finishes it. It says, but in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who died. Amen. He is risen. You know, this resurrection is not simply just a part of the gospel. It's not merely a feature of the gospel. The resurrection is the main event. Jesus was raised from the dead. Did you hear that? Jesus is raised from the dead. Amen, right? Christianity is tied entirely to the resurrection of Christ. Again, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that same chapter, but in verse uh, chapter 15, verse 51 and 52, he says, But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, When the last trumpet is blown. You know, I don't know the time or the hour that he's coming, but he says that we we will meet him in the clouds when he does come again, those who are living. Some of us may never die. And some of us, the people that have died, will will meet in the air. I I, I can't even imagine what that's even going to look like. It just blows my mind. I just can't wait for that. 
But he will come to collect all those who trust in him, all who trust in Jesus Christ, that who he's coming for, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. That's who he's coming back for. He also wished that none would perish, but all that would come to repentance, that all of us would all go with him. But repentance means in that changing of our lives, of changing the way we used to live. And start putting our faith and trust, not in the almighty dollar or in this world, but in Jesus Christ himself. Let's look at verse 7. So this angel says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. You know, this angel tells him, go take some action. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Tell them that he's alive and that Jesus will meet up with them in Galilee. But I want you to take notice. He tells them, tell the disciples and Peter. Why didn't he just say, hey, tell the disciples, go tell them that, I, that Jesus is risen. Why did, why did he say separate? Peter was separate. If you remember last time that Peter was sitting with Jesus, Jesus told him that he was going to deny him three times before the rooster crowed. In in Matthew 26, this gospel account says this in, in verse 33 to 35. It says, Peter declared, so this is tying to the story, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So, wow. So, Peter's probably pretty torn up. So, why go tell Peter? Peter's a mess. I'm sure that's all it, it's consuming him. That's all he, he could think about, that he denied his Christ. The guy that he walked and he ate with, he denied him. But go tell him and put him to rest. Tell him that I'm alive and I'm going to meet him in Galilee. This will set him to rest. That latter part of verse 7 says, just as he told you. These ladies here were believing what was going on here in, in the here and now. They were just seeing what the circumstance was. They had forgot that he told them, just as I tell you, well, that's just that I've told you. So much like today, we believe a lot of stuff on the news and other sources that get us all freaked out and get us confused. But Jesus told us that he was going to come back for us. We can either believe the lie or we can believe what Jesus told us. He said that we should be prepared. But are you and I looking for that time when Jesus actually comes back? Are you really excited for that? Or are your desires here in this temporary place? Have we built roots so deep here that when the rapture comes, it's going to be hard for him to pull you out of the ground? This is something we must think about. Don't ignore it. Don't let it pass by you. Really think about it. If Jesus is coming back, are you ready to see Jesus face to face? Really think about that. If you're waiting, he's coming in the air, and just think about what has to happen here and what has to take place. Are you ready to be there? Are you ready to do that? Many of us don't think about, about that. You know, this story here is crazy. and It gives us a lot of uh, imagery of what, what it looks like even in the church today. But if we, if we look at verse 8, it says, These women, they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This story ends abruptly. 
But it also ends dramatically. It also ends with amazement and wonder. You know, these women were so freaked out by what was happening and what they had seen. They fled. They ran from the tomb. But the most striking words are these. It says that they said nothing to no one, for they were afraid. What were they afraid of? They just saw this angel, and he told them to go tell them that Jesus was alive, and tell Peter and tell the disciples. And they fled and didn't say anything. What were they afraid of? What people might say or think about that? As many times with, we're freaked out about wanting to say something to others that their life is at risk of going into eternity separated from Jesus Christ. And we don't want to step up to the plate either. We don't want to say we're afraid of what they're gonna, people are going to say. Stand firm and preach the good, the good news. That's what people need to hear. Especially in this time where this chaos is going on, there's no hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ. So, what would have happened if we only had this gospel account and not any others? What would we be thinking right now? I think that we would be left at the edge of our chairs, possibly in despair. You and I wouldn't know the rest of the story because these women would have kept it to themselves. The disciples or anyone else wouldn't have known that he had risen and he was alive. You know, therefore, we could have been staying in this saddened state of despair. You know, these women and these disciples and Peter, they walk with Jesus, they age with Jesus, and now he's dead. Their friend is dead, and like they're living in like no hope. But what about Peter? Peter here is probably, like I said, probably pretty messed up. But if this news wouldn't have come to Peter, it could have pushed him to thoughts of suicide as Judas because of his actions. He denied his Lord. But the difference between Judas and Peter is found in the fact that Peter lived long enough to discover the truth of Jesus' redemptive love. He lived long enough to learn that while he may have denied Jesus, Jesus was in no way denying him. For that's for you this morning. Maybe you have denied Jesus. I've denied Jesus early on in my life and said, oh, it's not for me. But Jesus has never given up on you. He's never stopped searching for you because he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. He'll never give up on you. He's called the hound of heaven. He will continue to seek you out because he loves you. That's what our God does. He loves us. And he doesn't want anybody to perish without his knowing who he is. But thank God, we have other gospel accounts that are shared by these other guys. They got to see every angle. We got to see what happened to the rest of the story and it's been beautiful to be able to see the whole unfolding of that. But looking at this story this morning, what does it have to do with us? What does the story of Mark chapter 16 have to do with you and I this morning on Resurrection Sunday? Number one, we see that these women carried about, uh, they carried worry about things to come and the Lord took care of all of those worries that they had. But what about you? Are you worried maybe this morning about things that are happening today? Maybe what we must eat. What about my job? What about this disease? What about this stuff? I don't know what's going to happen in this world. Jesus, in fact, will take care of all of them if you put your faith and your trust in him. You will have that hope. 
In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 through 33, it says, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. There's a promise. Put that in the bank. Again, in Psalm 27, 1, he says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? Write that down. Circle it in your Bible. Highlight it. This psalmist knew what he was talking about when he wrote this. Secondly, Realize we serve a God that is alive. He has risen. Don't walk around with your head hung low. Even though the church buildings are empty this morning, the grave is not empty any longer. Jesus has risen. We should have a big amen for that. Psalm 46.1 tells us, God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. He's here right now to help you through the struggles. Again in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Talking about Jesus. But he laid his right hand on me saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And the living one, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. Wow, that just blows me away. It just excites me to the, to the point of tears because my God is alive. I don't have something that I carry around or that I pray to. I know my God's alive. Thirdly, what happens if we don't share this same story or the message of Jesus? People like Peter and these disciples could remain in despair and have no hope. If you and I are not being out there telling people that there is hope in Jesus Christ, they're probably living in despair with no hope during this time. There's hope in Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4 tell us, Blessed be the God and the Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Wow, there's a big inheritance waiting for you and I when we get there. Everybody likes inheritances. But it's only for those who put their faith and trust that he's put all of those things aside for us. Fourthly, Jesus is coming back. Do you believe this? Honey, ask yourself this. Do I believe Jesus is coming back? 2 Peter 3.9 tells us, the Lord isn't being slow about His promise. He's coming back. As some people think. No, He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Turn from their ways. Do you know what those ways are? If you read God's Word, it'll show you exactly what they are. And how He wants us and He's called us to live. It's only till we open up His words and they breathe life into us that we can see clearly after that the words of life. And fifthly and lastly, live by faith. Trusting in Jesus for everything. Walk by faith, not by sight. It's putting our trust in Him. 
Because if we're putting our faith in the sight that we've seen today, it's probably a mess and our compass is off. And we're disturbed. Refocus. Recalibrate this this morning. Recalibrate to the Lord Jesus Christ and on that cross. What he paid for us. That penalty he paid for you and for me. He said, while, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I still don't get that. While I was at my worst, he still was willing to pay a price because he knew that I would come to him at one point. And I hope that one, you have that same option. I, I, I hope that this morning, if you don't have that personal relationship, that you do. Ask the Lord, please, Lord, forgive me of what I've done. For, help me to turn from my evil ways. I understand now that you died and rose again for me. And you've prepared a place for me in heaven. It's, it's a simple thing. Read Romans 10, uh, verses 9 and 10. So live by, walk by faith, not by sight. But what I don't want you to get wrong is I don't mean sitting on your couch and not working anymore, waiting for Jesus. I'm just going to sit there till he comes back. No. But not allowing this world and all it has to stumble us and rule and reign in our thoughts. You know, our, this world, by what's going on, can take over. And we're driven by every wind. Stay steadied on Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 Verses 6 through 10 tells us, Therefore, always be confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. Verse 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from, from the body and at home with the Lord. Look at verse 9, So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while we're in the body, whether good or bad. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. He says when we're in this body, we're away from Him. And, and as I've said in previous messages, it's, it's all of these different things that are going on and these believers that are passing on from this disease are, are gaining much because they're with Christ in heaven. It's easier said than done to live by faith. But I want you to trust Him this morning. Put your full trust in Him this morning. Put your say, Lord... From what I've heard today, I want to know you. Please show me yourself. Start to open your book. Start to read your scriptures because he is alive and his word is alive. And it'll come out and transform you if you would let it. But I'm so thankful this morning that he is alive. He has resurrected and we have life knowing, life eternal knowing that he has been resurrected because in the last day, whether it's now or a hundred years from now, when he comes back, I'll still be with him. So I just want you to be, my brothers and sisters, to be there with me as we enjoy this uh, big meal together, the marriage supper of the Lamb at the last time. I can't wait to see you there. But until we meet again, walk by faith, not by sight. Trust in Him with all that you have. Don't look to the sides. Don't look what's going on. Look at Scripture for your main resource. I thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this time. Thank you for sharing your word with us. What an amazing time that you've shared with us this morning that, um, that you are in fact alive and that you have taken care of all of my worries, all of my needs, and Father, that you're our strong refuge. You are our strength. Father, you told us many of these things. You've given us many promises. May we adhere to the promises this morning and stop getting distracted by all of the stuff that's going on. May we refocus this morning, church. Refocus this morning. 
unto what's most important. So I just thank you so much for your love, Lord, and your care and your provision upon this church and upon the church at large, all the churches within here in Albuquerque and throughout the United States and throughout the world. I just ask your hand of blessing upon them. I ask your hand of protection amongst them. And Father, I just ask that people would see you during this time of craziness, Lord, that you would shine through for them. We thank you so much. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. the 
want to thank you all for uh, joining us today in this time of worship. Just remember God is on the throne. Praise God. Uh, we serve a risen Savior. 